Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who've seen me speak before, I've done a couple of events like this now, um, I always like to tackle a buzzword of the time, see it as a bit of a challenge because they're really annoying. Um, so I've done attribution in the past, uh, programmatic, RTB, that kind of thing. So I thought I'd go for omnichannel this time and kind of work out what it is. So obviously I had to learn what it is before doing the presentation. But um, now before we talk about omnichannel, what it is and why we should be doing it, the first thing I want to talk about is the consumer. And the reason it's important to talk about the consumer first is because all the marketing strategies we have, all the marketing plans we make, and the omni-channel approach are all there because of the consumer. We only do our marketing because the consumer needs to be marketed to. Everything we do in marketing is geared around what the consumer does. Perfect example would be mobile. Now, we've already said it probably three times today, and you've probably heard it over the last two or three years, that mobile has overtaken desktop. So as marketers, we all move to mobile. We all make sure we've got apps that our mobile sites work that people can convert on mobile. Essentially, we've moved to mobile because all of our consumers are now on mobile. So much more eloquently than I can say it is this quote, which essentially says, when consumers hear about a product today, their first reaction is, let me search for it. Um, so they go on a journey of discovery about the product, the service, the issue, the opportunity. And the key thing for me is this. So, Today, you're not behind your competition and you're not behind the technology, you are behind your consumer. And it's so true. If the consumer changes their behavior, we need to adapt to them. We can be you know, on par with our competitors, we can be up to date with all the technology, but if consumers suddenly start using mobile two times as much as they use desktop, we then have to chase them and make sure we adapt to what they're doing. Now, this is something that's probably not news to any of you in here. Consumer behavior has massively changed over the years. Consumer behavior is nothing like it was 10 years ago. It's not even how it was a year ago. Um, so it's always good to do an example of consumer behavior. And I always like to put an example, like a real life example with everything. Um, so I thought for this one, I'd use me. Um, now I'm just checking if the CEO is thinking, what the hell are you doing, Matt? Putting a picture of you and your dog in the presentation. But Rob, trust me, go somewhere. Um, so in this example, I'm the consumer, and this example serves two purposes. One, it gives me an example of a consumer journey, and two, it lets me show off my lovely new puppy, Lola, who uh, is very, very adorable, but a complete pain in the ass. Um, so when I got Lola a few, hmm, a few weeks ago now, um, everything was fine to start with, and then she started doing stuff she shouldn't. So she started eating my grass, and uh, eating furniture polish was a good one, um, stones, table, <laughs> my lovely new dining table, and even the wall, you know, she just chewed through the plasterboard and thought that'd be fun. Basically, she ate anything she could get her grubby little teeth on. Um, now, that's all fine, you know, stuff can be replaced, but the problem with my puppy eating all of this crap is that it made her very ill. So, very sick puppy, and we ended up going to the vets a number of times. Now, if any of you have ever taken a dog to the vets for sickness, you'll know it costs a lot of money. Um, and I ended up being charged an arm and a leg for this. So, bringing it back, because trust me, it goes somewhere. I realized as a newbie puppy owner, I needed pet insurance. Never bought it before, um, never had to think about it before, and no idea kind of where to start. So I went out to get some pet insurance. Now with my vet trips, the vet, charging me two, 300 pounds each time, obviously realized this, and recommended some pet insurance to me. So gave me a pamphlet for pet plan and said, you should buy this, we work with them, best insurance you can get, go get it. And it made me realize that this is probably a traditional customer journey. If we go back five, 10 years, this would be exactly what would happen. I go to the vets, they recommend their preferred supplier, and then I call up that supplier and I buy the insurance. Now that would have been a very sensible thing for me to do there and then, but obviously I didn't do that because none of us would have done that. Instead, oh, and sneak preview. Um, they recommended their preferred supplier. Um, I searched for them online. I looked at reviews of them. Um, I compared with other providers. I searched for details of what's covered. Um, I'm not ashamed to say I'm a member of many Beagle groups on Facebook, so I asked all of them for help as well. Um, I got multiple quotes, and then eventually I bought insurance. So in the course of this journey, rather than having the one or two touch points of just going to the vets and buying insurance, um, I had loads. I went all over the place. And this was online, offline, it was on mobile, it was on desktop, it was all over the place. And not only did I have all these touch points, during this whole journey, I also got shown all this noise as well. So I got remarketing ads and GDN ads, and it's on the radio and it's on TV, so it's everywhere. 
So my simple journey of just buying pet insurance then maybe had 20, 30 touch points. It had loads. And this is how consumer behavior has changed. We all should re relatively know this in the room is that, you know, five, 10 years ago, a single touch point was often how it was marketed. You see an ad on TV, you walk into the shop and you buy it. Whereas now it's not the case. You see the ad on TV and then you hit 40 other touch points and then you might buy it if all your friends say it's a good idea. So um, again, to put it more eloquently than I can, Marketing Week um, here quoted saying, 15 years ago, the average consumer used two touch points um, and only about 7% regularly used more than four, whereas now the average is six touch points um, with 50% regularly using more than four. And again, even six to me seems a bit low, I mean, especially for stuff like insurance or holidays um, or even magazines. Magazines, it might seem that maybe, you know, there's not that many touch points, but a little dip in some of our analytics accounts and you soon see, soon see, soon see um, how many touch points there are. So before this presentation, I picked one of our analytics accounts at random, won't say which publisher it is, um, and I thought I'd just have a little look at some of the journeys people take to buy. Now, a lot of them are pretty standard. You get stuff like this. So users come through organic search, then they've gone through email, then direct, then email again, then direct, and eventually converted. Um, you get a lot of these, so you get stuff like this. So organic, display, paid, more organic, and then paid. Some fun people do stuff like this, which really pains me. Uh, that's 15 paid ads that that person's clicked on, 15. Oh, it's painful. Sorry, Rob. Um, and then they've eventually converted direct. So that's brilliant. If we're looking at last click, we're all going to enjoy that one. Um, then you get really annoying people um, who, who do stuff like this, where they've not only clicked on a paid ad, they've gone through loads of referral sites, social networks, direct God knows how many times, organic, over 50 touch points there. Or really, really indecisive people who <laughs> God knows what the hell happened here, um, but that's over 100 touch points, including over 10 ads, load of social network ads, display ads, organic search, email, direct, even somewhere we just don't know where the hell they came from by the end they did all that. Um, so yeah, all over the place. And we know this. We know that consumers don't just go through one channel anymore. They do go all over the place. We're incredibly indecisive, and we like to check every review and every available thing online before we buy something. So. What's everyone in here done, and myself, and, and all of the marketers, is we've changed how we market to these people. We've gone from doing single channel marketing, where we know we need to be in the shop, we need to be in the vets with our pamphlet, um, to multi-channel marketing, where we know we need to be in the vets with our pamphlet, but we also need to be on desktop, and mobile, and maybe TV, and radio. We realize that people aren't just on that one channel, so we make sure we're not just on that one channel. We market to them everywhere, and that's great. That maybe solves the problem except there's a massive problem with that as well. Sorry, it's all doom and gloom for a bit, but it goes up towards the end. Um, the problem with multi-channel marketing is that although a multi-channel strategy uses all the different mediums together, they're still distinct and individual, which can lead to a somewhat fragmented and confused journey. To put some stats behind it, because we all like stats, um, according to eConsultancy and Adobe, 14% of marketers join up their campaigns across all channels, so only 14% which means a lot of marketers who have no consistency across channels. In fact, 11% of marketers have zero integration across any channel, which is crazy. Yet, going back to my original point of how we need to make sure we're doing what the consumer wants, 90% of consumers expect consistent interactions across all channels. So 90% of the people we're trying to sell to are saying they want a consistent journey, yet 11% aren't doing any consistency at all. Only 14% are actually bringing everything together, which is crazy. So again, we are behind that consumer. Now, to put it into a real life example, again, examples are always really good. Um, this is a company called Beerhawk, who a couple of weeks ago sent me an email basically saying, um, you've saved up some beer tokens because you bought a load of beer online. You have 10 pound credit. Do you want to buy some beer? Nothing wrong with the email. It's great, uh, looks like a good email, and I might go through and buy some. Didn't at the time, um, but then they kept marketing to me, so I then received a Facebook ad from them. But this Facebook ad is now showing me a Christmas beer advent calendar. So absolutely nothing to do with the email I received about me having the points or the marketing in it, completely different imagery, uh, messaging, everything. They also talked to me on Instagram, and now they're showing me a mystery box. Pay 20 quid, get all different types of beer in your box. 
If I search them on Google, I get their standard ad, which references none of the touch points I've had so far, um, but just tells me I can get free delivery on an order over 50 pounds. If I go onto the site, I get 10% discount, so completely different again. And finally, they remarket to me on The Guardian and show me that I can buy two, save 10%, or buy four and save 20%. And this is the common problem, is that, <laughs> Rob's looking show, it's mad. <laughs> um, this is the common problem in that we've realized as marketers, oh, our users aren't just using one channel anymore. We best be across all these channels. But then what happens is we treat all those channels individually. Oh, and I'm going to do a test with this ad in this channel. Or I'm going to test this box in this channel. And I'm going to test this over here. Rather than bringing it all together and realizing that the consumer doesn't care about your tests. The consumer doesn't know whether you're doing a test in Facebook or doing a test on Instagram. The consumer is seeing you as one brand. And this is a very confused journey. It makes no sense. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I don't know what the best offer is to buy. And by the end, I just don't even bother buying anything. Now, I used Beer Hawk as an example because I didn't want to stand up here and start showing up covers of magazines and showing where I'd got it, you know, someone had got it all wrong. But this is a common problem, and it happens for a lot of publishers too. I won't name the magazine, but um, I did do the same thing where I just found one online and thought, you know, what kind of prices and, and mixed messaging can I find? And I found one which, when I clicked through a PPC ad, Google search, um, I got offered an annual subscription for £28. Went through the SEO listing, got offered an annual subscription for £33 now, so it's gone up. Um, but now there's a six-month offer for £15. Um, I went through an affiliate site, got six months for £9.99 now, so completely different. Um, then I found an in-mag promotion, and it was an annual subscription for £16, so really dropped the price down. So now that's only a little bit more than the six-month offer before. Um, and then they emailed me and said, do you want to buy it for £29.99? Well, not really, no, because <laughs> I could have had it for 16 quid a minute ago. Um, and again, this is very easy to find. You know, this is a common problem. So we've moved to multi-channel marketing. We're hitting users on all those channels, but we're giving them a really confused and mixed messaging. Now, what do we do then? Well, I'm not going to say the solution is omni-channel, because actually there's a solution before omni-channel. And the one before that is cross-channel. Now, cross-channel marketing is where we still realize that we need to hit up audiences across all these different places, that our users are all over the place, um, but we realize that we have to have consistency in there. So, give you an example. If we take National Geographic, um, someone goes to Google and searches for that, they'll get 12 issues for £25. Um, if we target them on Facebook, they'll still get 12 issues for £25, with a little imagery of the Titanic there for that latest issue. Go on Instagram, again, 12 issues for £25, and again, the same imagery. Same with remarketing, and same with email um, and on the site. So again, we're hitting all these touch points. We realize that our customers are across them all, um, but now what we're doing is making sure that they have a, a consistent experience. So they always get the same offer, the same messaging, and that, therefore it's not confusing. At no point are they going to say, well, hang on, I saw it cheaper earlier. I best wait about or I might see it cheaper later. It's just a consistent message. And the branding, unlike the Beer Hawk example, the branding is just the same all the time. Now, that's great. And that's kind of where we're heading towards. You know, We're moving from the multi-channel to the cross-channel. Um, and it works well. But it's still not what our consumers are demanding. So that works from a practical point of view Then it makes it consistent. But what consumers are telling us they now want is this, which is omni-channel. An omni-channel still has the consistent messaging that multi-channel has, still makes sure that we're not confusing the user. What it also does is make sure that all the channels are talking to each other, that the data gathered from each channel all plays into the other channels. So again, a quote that will sum it up much better than I can um, is one here saying that omni-channel is viewing the experience through the eyes of your customer, orchestrating the, orchestrating the customer experience across all channels so that it's seamless, integrated, and consistent. It anticipates that customers may start in one channel and move to another as they progress to a resolution. And simply put, omni-channel is multi-channel done right. So if we take that National Geographic example again and take an omni-channel approach, we'll start with a search, but this time a generic search. So users gone for, could humans live on Mars? Now at that point, this is a brand new customer. So the only thing we know about them is that search. We haven't got any data on them yet. That's all they've done. 
So what we can do to start with is take that information and make sure we are bidding on the right term and make sure that that search is in the ad. So it's the one bit we know about them. We can also make sure that we send them through to the most relevant page. So rather than just saying buy the issue or buy 12 for 25 pounds, send them through to content that they're going to be interested in. Now, as soon as they land on the site, we do start picking up loads of information about them. What pages they've been on, excuse me, how long they've been on the site, have they taken any further action, browse about, even their location, gender, all things like this. So at this point, if they then go away, and let's say they move on to Facebook, we know what they've done. And let's say the user only spent a couple of minutes on that page, didn't read the full article, hasn't taken any further action. We might remark it to them and say, well, why don't you continue reading about the race to the red planet? So the marketing is still consistent, like with cross-channel, the branding's the same, the price is still going to be the same, but now we're taking that information we've got from them and saying, well, you were reading about this, why don't you keep reading about it? If they then say go back to search, as we saw before, people jump all over the place, and now let's say they search for the brand again, we can again reference this information. So when that user searches for the brand, we make sure we tell them the Mars issues landed, that's the one that you can get. We bring that back into the search. Then let's say this time they go on to the site and they make their way into the funnel. Um, so in the funnel, we make sure we reference the Mars issue again. Um, and at this time, we start introducing them to the offer, make sure they know all the pricing, everything, which is still consistent to the pricing in the ad and the pricing before. Now, if they go this far, we might start picking up more information about them, their name, their email address, their address, things like that. So if they drop out, we want to keep marketing to them, but we want to use this information. So now we might email them and say, Matthew, did you have trouble completing your subscription? Because we picked up their name, we know how far they were down the funnel. We could still even reference the Mars content at this point. And then if they search again, we can reference it all, saying, why don't you continue your purchase, send them back straight into the funnel now rather than to the content, and even pre-populate the fields if we can so that they have that consistent journey. And then eventually, if they do convert, we could even upsell to them because we know information about them, we know what price point they've gone for, so we might upsell to them and say, why don't you now buy it as a gift for someone else? Now, we don't have to do all of this, and there's even loads more we could do if you wanted to make it even bigger. But the point is, from the user's point of view, that becomes one seamless journey with a brand. They moved across channels, they moved across all these different touch points, but the journey was just one big journey with National Geographic where it knew about them and it was consistent. Rather than that fragmented journey of Beer Hawk where it's all over the place, or just the plain journey of just giving the same message over and over, which is fine, but it doesn't really take into account anything about that person as an individual. So that's the dream, that's where we all wanna be, and the reason we wanna be there is because the results tell us that that's gonna get us better results. So um, what we know is that campaign integrate, uh, campaigns integrating four or more digital channels will outperform single or dual, dual channel campaigns by 300%, and that companies with strong on channels see a 9.5% year on year increase in revenue compared to 3.4 for week. Now the stats that I think are probably gonna be um, more powerful for everyone in here is firstly this one, which is omnichannel customers' engagement retain on average 89% of their customers versus 33% for companies with weak omnichannel. And that's obviously important to everyone in here, is that retention. And something that's already been mentioned today, which is the upsell of other products and diversification of revenue. Um, and what we know is that omnichannel customers are likely to spend 25% more due to better optimized uh, cross-selling and upselling. So because we know stuff about them and we're trying to sell them extra products based on that information, they're likely to spend more. And again, going right back to the start, it's not just about the results, it's not just about the marketing we want to do, it's all about the consumer. And what the consumers are telling us is that 87% of customers think that brands need to put more effort into providing a seamless experience. And the one that's kind of scary, given that we're already coming up to 2018, is that by 2020, the demand for an omnichannel customer experience will be amplified by the need for nearly perfect execution. So you've all got two years. <laughs> and then all this needs to be done. Um, so I hope that's useful. The point is, like I say, is that we need to think about this customer, think about what they're seeing, how they perceive the brand, rather than just getting bogged down in our own tests and just thinking, we'll do this over here, we'll do this over here. The customer sees you as one brand, they're having one big journey with you, and as we know, they're gonna jump all over the place, so we have to adapt to that. So I hope that's useful, um, and if nothing else, you got to see a cute dog. So I um, hope you enjoyed it, and that's me. I'll take any questions. Yeah.